Hi, welcome to Modern East Asia 101. I'm your host, Sean Kim, aka The Dragon Historian, and today we're going to continue our journey through China and discuss the causes, processes, and effects of the Taiping Rebellion. So our story begins with this guy named Hong Xiuquan, a poor commoner from a village near Canton. He was very academically ambitious and sought to get into the Chinese government via passing the imperial examinations, which was pretty much the coolest thing a Chinese male could do at the time. Hint hint, women could not participate. Anyhow, Hong studied very hard for the examinations, beginning his studies when he was just four years old. His first attempt at the imperial examinations was in 1827, when he was only 12 years old. Naturally, he failed the examination, so he studied harder. In 1836, at age 22, Hong visited Canton and decided to take the test there. He failed again, but during his visit at Canton, an evangelical Christian missionary gave Hong a book titled The Chen Shi Liang Yen, which roughly means Good Words Admonishing the World. He briefly read it and put it back on the shelf. He did not think much of it at the time, but that little booklet would change Chinese history. In 1837, the year after the previous attempt, Hong took the imperial examination and failed again. This time, Hong had a mental breakdown and collapsed. But during the recovery, Hong had a series of visions via dreams in which he met two figures, a paternal elderly man and a brotherly middle-aged man. The former with a golden beard told Hong to turn away from his worship of demons and worship him instead, and the other encouraged him throughout his journeys to defeat said demons. After re-examining the earlier Christian booklet, he realized that he could draw many parallels between the contents of the book and his own dreams. Eventually, he came to the conclusion that he was the second son of God, making him the younger brother of Jesus. He began to believe that he had been sent by God to save the Chinese people from false idols such as Confucius, as well as the ruling Manchus. He was a teacher at the time, but he began to destroy Confucian works and he was fired in 1844. After this, he joined with Feng Yunshan, a fellow Christian convert, and began to preach Christianity together in the province of Guangxi. His teachings were very popular in Guangxi because the population was predominantly Hakka, a group within the Han Chinese people who speak the Hakka dialect and was often discriminated against. In fact, Hong was a Hakka himself. After a few months, the two returned to Guangdong, at which point they co-founded the God Worshipper Society. The God Worshipper Society was very successful in the provinces of Guangxi and Guangdong, and in just a few months they collected 2,000 followers. And by 1850, that number had grown to nearly 30,000. The God Worshipper Society not only preached Christianity, but also advocated for some awesome stuff, like gender equality, abolishing the class system, and racial equality. Well, unless you're the Manchus. If you're the Manchus, you had to die. And so did non-Christians. So religious freedom? Clearly not on their list of awesome stuff. The god worshippers also took on the task of defeating local pirates and bandits. However, the Qing government allowed little religious freedom and suppressed the worshippers. The worshippers were not happy with the Manchus before, but now they had more reasons to be angry. The idea of a revolt began to spread across the community. Finally, on January 11th, 1851, the god worshippers started the Jintian uprising at the town of Jintian in Guangxi. After killing hundreds of Qing soldiers, Hong Xiuquan declared the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. The Taiping subsequently fled the province of Guangxi and traveled north, and they were defeated by Qing soldiers on the way multiple times. Nevertheless, the Taipings managed to capture Nanjing on March 19, 1853. Nanjing became the heavenly capital of Taiping. The Taipings were mostly active around the Yangtze River, capturing several major cities along the river. However, their failure to capture Shanghai eventually resulted in a loss of momentum for the Taipings. Another factor for the Taiping's downfall was internal strife. Yang Xiuqing, a young but influential military commander, had several disagreements with Hong Xiuquan. In essence, Yang believed that some parts of Confucianism, such as its moral codes, were to be kept, while Hong wanted to eradicate them all. In 1856, Yang attempted a military coup but failed, weakening the government severely. Nevertheless, the 1850s was, in general, a good decade for the Taipings. That all ended in 1862, when the Taipings failed to take Shanghai after more than a year of siege. Even Western powers, primarily France and the United Kingdom, intervened on the side of the Chinese government. After this defeat, the anti-Taiping alliance took away their territory rapidly. In spring of 1864, Hong Xiuquan abdicated the throne in favor of his son. Hong Xiuquan died of food poisoning in June later that year, and Nanjing fell to the alliance a few days later. The Taiping Rebellion was a disaster. Over the span of 14 years, it killed over 20 million people. That enormous death toll makes the rebellion the third most destructive war in recorded human history. Fighting was not all that the Taipings did though. The Taiping government actually did implement some social reforms. Some of them were awesome, others were awful, yet the rest I'm afraid to share my opinion of due to potential flame wars. Well, let's start with the awesome ones. First of all, slavery was abolished. 
Second, gender equality was implemented, and women could participate in the imperial examinations for the first time in Chinese history. The class system was also abolished. They also banned foot binding, a barbaric practice in which girls' feet were bound to keep them from growing, because apparently Chinese men at the time thought that a dysfunctional, deformed foot was attractive. Now onto the bad stuff. First of all, the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom was an absolute monarchy and a theocracy. Evangelical Christianity was declared the state religion, and there was no religious freedom. There was also heavy segregation of the sexes, and up until 1855, not even married couples could live together or have sexual relations. And all the killing was pretty bad too. And here's some other stuff that they did. First, the Bible became the primary subject of the imperial examinations, replacing Confucian classics. They also replaced the traditional lunar calendar with a solar calendar, and the Q hairstyle of the Manchus was banned. The Taiping government also made opium, tobacco, alcohol, prostitution, and polygamy illegal, all of which were punishable by death. Funny enough, Hong Xiu Quan himself practiced polygamy. Oh, and lastly, the Taipings abolished all private land ownership and had the government distribute all land. If this sounds like communism to you, well, you're right, Chairman Mao would agree. The Communist Party of China, which is to play a significant role in Chinese history in just a few decades, looked to the Taipings as their inspiration. But at the time, the Qing rulers were not very inspired. And understandably too, because to them, the Taipings were nothing more than rebels who had left China in ruins. Also, thanks to the Taipings, the Chinese also lost another important war. The Second Opium War. Yeah, there were two of them, unfortunately. We will talk about that next time. Thank you for watching and I'll see you guys then. Thank you for watching Modern East Asia 101, I'm the Dragon Historian, subscribe to my YouTube channel if you want to see more of my content, you can follow me on Twitter to get instant updates on this show and this channel, and um, that's it for this week, uh, thank you guys for watching again, and I'll see you guys next time.